Well, what we wanted to cover tonight <clears throat> was, you know, we spent lots of weeks examining examining uh, the Mosaic Law last week and before that um, we looked at Samson and before that we went through Genesis and we just, we considered a number of things that the Word of God has to say and historical events as they unfolded in Genesis. We looked at the, the various places where uh, sexual sin came in. And what we wanted to cover tonight is how, how do you battle? How do you fight? And you know, let's really, if you're in the battle, that's, that's really what, I mean, you want tools. You want somebody to come along and say, here's how you do it. And here's, here's the solution. If you struggle with loneliness or you struggle with, uh, you know, unfulfilled sexual desires, you just, you battle with lust, you battle with that temptation, you battle with, with the remnants of homosexuality, you know, whatever it is, whatever kind of sexual immorality that we might be tempted to. And you know, the thing is, this, this is, it's obviously something that, you know, when you're young, you have Paul saying to Timothy, flee youthful lust. The thing is, some, some of these things are, um, you know, they're, they're difficult to the end, but they can be definitely intensified and are even referred to as youthful lust. They can be intensified in, in youth. Um, I remember, and I think of um, speaking to one pastor uh, on an occasion, uh, Kyle White and I, we had lunch with a pastor from Mansfield, Texas, and he he was telling us about some 96-year-old or something like that year old man in his assembly. And uh, this pastor said that he asked this this old guy in his church, does the battle ever stop? And this man in his 90s said no. Now, does it become less intense? Possibly. Probably. I mean, it's not called youthful lust for no reason. I mean, there's things that in youth, there's things that when we're teenagers or in our 20s can be, can be stronger as far as the temptation goes. So, what do we do? I mean, what's the... There's no question about it that we see what's wrong. There's no question that we see and hear the word flee youthful lust. Okay, is that all there is to it? You just run. You just anytime you see anything, you just run. And certainly that's what we're being called to do. We're being called to run away. But is that enough? Are there enough tools there? Just just run away. Just, you know, okay, um, I mean, don't let anybody deceive you with empty words. It's because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I mean, is, it, is that enough? Don't associate with them. Don't have any... Is it enough for us to hear in the Word of God, run, Flee fornication. Flee youthful lusts. Jesus comes along and He says, you know, if you even look at a woman and you lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart already. And He goes on, He's talking about, okay, you gouge out... He's, he's given us pretty graphic symbolism. Gouge out an eye. Chop off a hand. If that's, if that's what it takes, it's better for you to lose those things and go into the kingdom, into heaven, than you being cast away not having done those things, being whole. Okay, is that enough? We, we can see it's wrong. 
here you are, and you're now identifying with Christ. I'm going to be a follower of Christ. And lust comes in like a storm. You're being tempted. You just There is a draw, there is a pull, there is a desire that just feels like it's going to swallow you up. And what do you do? Is it enough just to say, well, flee, flee youthful lusts? I mean, if you know, you go to somebody and you, you're, you're wanting accountability and you're confessing to them, I struggle with this. Well, just flee from it. Just run away. I mean, is that, is that good? Is that enough? Do you, find that, do you find that helpful? Is it enough just to know, hey, if you don't cut these things off, you're gonna, God's going to throw you in hell. Is that enough? Is that good? Is that what we need to fight? I mean, look, I think, I think we would all admit this. You know, any, anybody here that's past puberty, you know about sexual desire and temptation. Now, we may all be at different points in our life as far as, you know, the type of temptations that we encounter. Some of you may come from a background where there was homosexuality and you struggle with that. And that is a massive temptation. Others, we, you know, it's, it's just something that you have never struggled with. But you, you struggle likewise. I mean, look, the Scripture doesn't put homosexuality into a category away from sexual immorality as a whole. Fornicators and adulterers don't inherit the kingdom of heaven just as much as homosexuals don't. It's not like just because it, it's, it's heterosexual that it's somehow okay. It's damnable. It's, it's, I mean, let no one deceive you with empty words. The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience because of just such sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, that's why. So, you know what? Now, I'm going to say something about this that's obvious to every one of you. That if you just suddenly didn't have a desire for it that would fix it, right? If all the desire was just taken away, that would fix it. I mean, you know, think about it. The, the, the fact is that the kind of attraction, the kind of lust, the kind of draw, the kind of temptation that we feel towards whatever it is, the opposite sex or the same sex, I mean, you don't feel that towards a tree along the side of the road. There are all manner of objects in this world you have no attraction for at all. You don't have any problem with that. You don't have any problem where there's no attraction. If we could just turn the switch off. And really, in Christianity, isn't that kind of what it's all about? It's not turning it off. But, you know, if, if we just... If we just simply got to a place where our desire was diminished or another desire was increased, then we're on our way to fixing the problem. I mean, isn't that what has to happen? You know, why do people fall to sexual sin? It's because that draw, that temptation is strong enough that right at that moment they just give way. They have no other desire that's greater at that moment to hold them back. That becomes the greatest desire. That becomes the deception, right? Because with these things, they're, they're deceptive desires. I mean, that's what, that's what you have in Ephesians. It talks about putting off the old man, which belongs to your former manner of life. And it, it talks about these desires. They're, they're, they're corrupt. They're deceitful. They're deceitful desires. Why is it deceitful? Because it gives you a promise. And right at that time, you believe that promise 
and you're drawn towards the promise it gives you of satisfaction, of pleasure, and nothing else is stronger right at that moment. That's why you cave. That's why people cave to it. It's like nothing else matters. But if you can actually get to a place where something else does matter more, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, how can I do what I can't do? Well, if I'm enabled to do it, right? That, I mean, that's, that's basically it. It's kind of like, if, you know, if you have a child and you say to your child, you know, go, go pick up that barbell over there. They say they can't. Well, if I work with my child and I get them to the place where they're strong enough to do it, well, then they can do it. And that's the solution. And so if we got to the place... The truth is, if we got to a place where we didn't desire that as much and we desired other things more, then you fix the problem. If you can kill the deceitful desires to where you don't desire it as much. You know, there's things that I desired when I was lost. Like, I I literally, when I was lost, I was like a caged animal on Friday nights and Saturday nights. I mean, if I was at home, I, uh, something came over me that was uncontrollable. I could not be at home. I needed to be out where something was happening. I needed to be out where my friends were. I needed to be where the party was. I needed to be where the people, I needed to be at the bar. If I wasn't, I literally, I mean, I had a feeling inside me. It was uncontrollable. And that's how it is when we're lost. We have these lusts. We have these draws, these pulls. There's, we can't resist them. They pull so hard, there's nothing in us that wants to resist it. Our will is to go with it. Because we think, we, we buy into the lie that it's, it's going to satisfy us. But if, if we got to the place where we actually were enabled not to desire. That's what, that's what we need. We need the power of it killed. But now here's, here's what Scripture says. All who belong... How many of you know or have ever heard a verse out of uh, Galatians 5, verse 24? It says something there about all who belong to Christ. Anybody know what it says? What's true of everybody who belongs to Christ? The flesh has been crucified with its lusts and desires. Now you think about that. Lust and desire has been crucified. What's your idea of crucifixion? What does that look like? And what does it mean to crucify something? Torture and death. I mean, you nail somebody to a cross, your intent is is to kill them. It's to suck the life out of them and do it in a torturous fashion. What this is saying is that our flesh, if we belong to Christ, certain things happen to our desires. There's this idea of killing them. And, And it's true that what happens is the desires are being crucified. It says crucified, like it's over and done, but we know that we have to cut off. We know that there's a battle. We know that we have to flee from youthful lusts we, because we know that there's a draw there. But what, that, what, what Galatians 5.24 is saying is this is just true. If you belong to Christ, the pull is not. The, the pull is is the difference between a very active, very lively, very strong person and one hanging on a cross. That's that's the difference. If it's not dead yet, the blood's draining out of it, and it's hanging up there, and the life is going out of it until it's finally gone all together and we get swept into heaven. So this is is a truth. Look, You cannot take that text, and I recognize there are other ones that emphasize that there's a battle. There's other ones that emphasize that we need to put certain things to death. There's other ones that say not to let sin reign in your mortal bodies. 
to obey the passions of that body. Obviously, there's still passions there, but there's an assumption now that you have an ability to not let that sin rule there. Which means the passions of the body have been diminished because of the crucified flesh and there's offsetting desires. You desire other things more. In fact, we're to desire to please God. We're to desire the will of God. We're to desire to please God. We're to have a hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those are realities. It's a power issue. It takes power. Have you ever, have you ever considered this, these verses? You, you know them, and oftentimes we, we quote the first part. You know, you know what it says right there towards the end of Ephesians 3? Now unto Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, or all that we ask or think, what does it say right after that? Anybody know? According to the power at work within us. You know what's true of the Christian? There's a power at work within us. So if you're a Christian, there's a power at work within you. The passions that you formerly had are crucified. And there's a power at work within you. And you know what it's you know how it says it there in Romans 8 13? What does it say in eight, the second half of 8 13? Romans. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you shall live. Okay. Here's what we need. We need power that is going to cause us to put to death the deeds of the body. And how do we do it? We do it in the power of another. We do it in the power of the Spirit. And what clearly, I mean, what happens? What happens? Where when you're lost or when you fall as a Christian, what happens right at that moment is you give in to the desire of the body. Clearly the power then that delivers us from that, the power of the Spirit, is going to do one of two things or a mixture of both. He is going to reduce our desire for illicit satisfaction and or give us desires for other things that are greater. I mean, think about this. David Butterbaugh just had his 50th uh, birthday at a, at a Chinese restaurant. I went there hungry. It's, I mean, you, you walk out, it's a buffet. I, I had the buffet. You walk out in the buffet at a Chinese restaurant. Any of you been to the Chinese restaurants with buffets? It's like, how many of the, of the, you know, the stuff that they're serving there, how much of it's good? How much of it tastes really good? I mean, most people probably look at... You know, you need to be calculated because if you just go really hungry and you go to the first thing you see, you're likely to just fill your plate up with it. And then you walk down the line and you're like, oh, they have this. I don't even have room on my plate anymore because everything is good. But you know what? If you're in a place like that, I knew there was something I wanted. I'd been there before, right before Charity went to, to India. I'd had that salmon there before. And I purposely bypassed many other things that had an attraction to me because I wanted that more. And you know, it's really the same kind of thing when it comes to Christian life. When you get to the place where you want to please Christ more, you want righteousness more, you want to be a good example more, 
You don't want to shame your wife or your kids more. You don't want to disgrace the ministry more. You want intimacy with Christ more. You want His smile more. You don't want to grieve the Spirit more. You want to be able to open up the Word of God and have it come to life more. You want to go to prayer and feel liberty and freedom and joy more. You want to be able to sit down on a Sunday morning and sing the songs, just be filled with making melody in your heart to the Lord. You want that more than you want the pleasure of looking at some of it on the internet that's inappropriate. Now, that's, that's a little bit different idea. That tells you that there's a way out. That tells you that you never have the excuse, I had no option, because you did. But that, that text doesn't really touch on the power. And that's, we need power. We need a power that alters our desires. And, well, the power is... God, yes, but more precisely, the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, I actually have to figure out how to walk the Christian life drawing on the power of another, and it's real power. According to the power at work within us. It's, it is a power. In fact, it is a power that Paul wants us to try to grasp. He calls it an immeasurable greatness of power. And it is the very power that God used to raise Christ from the dead. It is resurrection power. Now, Tafik read today all 15 chapters of Delivered by Desire. So he undoubtedly came across a lot of good stuff in there because that, that probably is one of the better, if not maybe even one of the best works that's out there right now on, uh, on this subject. So go ahead, brother. Tell us what the Lord showed you. Well, basically what you were just saying, um, as I was reading it, it reminded me of, um, maybe you have heard of something called Juneteenth. It's a, it's a celebration, and basically what it celebrates is that the, the slaves in America had been liberated. They were freed, but those in Texas didn't know it, so they continued in their slavery, although they were free. And then when word came to them that they were freed, they left their chains and went on in their freedom. And the, the majority of the book focuses your attention on the reality that you're free. And it's, just like he, it's just like he was saying, that the, that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You do not have to do that sin. You're not a slave to that. You were a slave to sin. That's your old man. You are now a new creation who has the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, which gives you power to put that sin to death. One of the things that um, the brother was talking about in the book, he said that, you know, the the proverbial, the chicken with the head cut off. You cut the head off of the chicken, it will continue to run around. Um, I've killed a couple of snakes in my life, and they continue to slither. And that is what you're battling. If you're a believer, it's not that you have this wicked nature and you're regenerated nature is battling your wicked nature. If you're a believer, you have a new heart. This is the new covenant promise. I will put a new heart in you. Um, we have the spirit of God. We have a new nature. We are born again. We are born from above. Where the, the, the metamorphosis has taken place and the old man is put to death. Behold, all things have become new. This is who you are. But you say, well, why am I still battling? Why am I still wrestling with this? And that's the flesh that still lives. But it's like he said, it's hanging on a cross. The blood is dropping out of it. It's a chicken with his head cutting off. And it, 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 it's going to die. It's going, it's gradually as you continue on, ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth, 
it will be done away with completely and our new bodies will be, be given to us. But before he jumped in to, you know, the, the, the tactics and, and the strategies, and, and I've found that as I talk to uh, the young brothers who are battling with this thing, I always want to know, okay, so what do I do? You know, they, they, they want strategies. But what I've noticed in the scripture, what the Lord does, you look at the book of Romans, before he starts talking about how to live this thing out, it's focusing on who we are in Christ. And that's so serious. What Pastor Tim was saying is so essential that you must face the reality that you are free, that you are new, that you are released from the chains of sin and you do not have to do this any longer. You look at places like Ephesians chapter 1 where he says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has been given to you. Every spiritual blessing. Surely this includes the spiritual blessing putting sin to death. Surely it includes a spiritual blessing of walking in integrity, walking in honesty, walking in the light of the Lord. Look in 2 Peter where it says that all things have been granted to you regarding life and godliness. Thank you, brother. It's by the divine power that this has been granted. So you have it, everything that you need, if you're a believer, everything that you need to walk in purity, to walk in integrity, to put sexual sin away, you have it. You're not trying to earn it. You're not trying to build it. You already have it. Now you need to cultivate that. And I, on, on my way here, um, I was listening to Pastor Tim as he was talking about the same subject a few years ago, um, the battle the battle of the mind regarding abstaining from sexual sin. And he focused our attention on beholding the Lord and the reality that you, will, you are far less likely to go and chase after sexual sin after you have just beheld the glory of God. Brought up some examples, Isaiah <laughs> He saw the Lord high and lifted up, fell upon his face. Peter, he saw the Lord in his glory as he filled the boat with the, sh- with the fish. He fell on his face, depart from me. Moses, <laughs> the, the hind quarters of the Lord passing by the cleft of the rock as he's hidden in there. His face is glowing. He comes down. The people are terrified and they say, cover your face. The glory of the Lord, what it does to us, it brings worship out of us, a holy fear, a holy reverence. It, 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 it requires a response, and that response is not going on the Internet and looking at pornography. It is, it, that response be, after beholding the glory of the Lord is not going and fornicating with your girlfriend or looking at the girls as they walk down the street. After you behold the Lord, the response is worship. The, the response is awe. The response is, is intimacy and, and a desire to learn more about him and get into his presence all the more. And so the, the book, um, after it continually emphasized the necessity of who you are in God, it's the indicative, who you are. This is who you are. You look at Romans. It's who you are. Ephesians, first chapter one, who you are. If you are a believer, you're in Christ. You have the spirit of God. You're chosen by God. You're forgiven of your sins. He has not just saved you from the, from the wrath of God. He saved you from the power of sin. You have that. Now what do you do? Well, he gave some help. One of those things is, the Word of God. You got to get into the Word of God, read it, memorize it. Excuse me, he, he gave an example of an officer. And the officer walks around with a pistol or firearm, if you will, on his side. He said, Now, how foolish would it be if he was on duty and his weapon was in his trunk? It would be of no help. It's not easily accessible. It's not grabbable. He said that many believers, you have the truth, you have the word of God, but it's in the back of your mind. 
and it's in the back of your mind when the temptation comes, it's not readily grabbable. And you look at Jesus, he's in the garden, rather in the wilderness, the devil's there. He comes to him with temptation. And what does he instantly do? Because the word of God is instantly right in the beginning, right in the front of his mind, he could say, it is written, it is written, it is written. It was there, it was accessible, it was ready. It was a weapon, a sword that is ready in the hand. Because if you're prepared, you don't want to wait until the temptation comes to try to search for the scripture. Okay, what does it say about lust? No, you want to have that already in your mind so that when it comes, you can instantly respond to the lie. Because that's what it is. It's like Pastor Tim said. It's a lie. Every temptation that comes to you is coming with a lie. And the lie is, I will satisfy you. The lie is, you deserve this. The lie is, it's not that bad. You're just doing this. You're not doing that. The lie is, well, you already fell, so what's the, what's the big deal if you do it again? The lie is, well, God's already forgiven you, so this is already provided for. All these lies have truth that will destroy them. And all these lies are constantly being thrown at you. When you're out at school, when you're at work, when you're in the mall, when you're in the store, when you're watching television, when you're just laying there and they're coming to your mind, the images, the pictures, they're constantly presenting something to you that you must have a response for. And that response has to be the word of God. That is where we fight. It's like he said, the battle is in the mind. That's where most of the battle takes place in the mind. And so you have to fill your mind with the word of God. Isn't that what the psalmist says in Psalm 119? How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to his word. I love that. It's a picture. I see like a security guard guarding the door. The lie tries to come in. The security guard's there. He stops it. It's the word of God. You can't come in here. It's guarded. It's protected. But then you have another picture in Proverbs. The man without control is like a city without walls. Anything can come in. There is no guard. There is no protection. There's no barrier. There's nothing to block against and everything comes in. The word of God is where our help is found. I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is where the battle is fought. And this is in large part where it's won. But another thing that he also illustrated, something that's been extremely helpful to me, is you have to have fences. What I mean by that is you have barriers, you have standards, you have things that are already set in your mind that you will not do, places you will not go, things you will not watch, things you will not listen to, such situations and scenarios that will not be allowed into your life. Before they happen, you can't start making up lists and rules and standards and building fences when the war is on. You have to have it now. Build them now. Because when they come, and they are coming, that wall is already there. So, you know, these are some of the things that the brother was bringing forth in the book. The word of God, putting it in, memorizing it, meditating upon it, having um, barriers that are up. Like the, the, the Bible says, flee, right? Flee sexual immorality, abstain from it. And one of the ways he was pointing out that you flee from it is not just when it comes, but you flee from it by preparing for it beforehand. And that's another way of fleeing. You know, I think, <clears throat> I think if, if you just ask somebody, hey, those that are, those that are purest, those that excel in the kingdom. They're men and women of the word. Right? You, you'd, you'd say that. I mean, is that, is that characteristic of somebody that's getting victory? Yeah, they're in the word. What's, what's the connection? I mean, let's, <clears throat> let me just tell you. Paul says it. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill what 
you, you won't do the works of the flesh. You won't, right? And that includes all manner of sexual perversion, sexual immorality. You won't do that. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't do it, right? Doesn't it say that? Doesn't he say that in, in Galatians 5? What's that? He certainly says it. This is a solution for all of you and for every single Christian that's ever lived. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not... Look, the first thing is you got to be saved. you got some people trying to, trying to be Christian who aren't Christian and it's just failure. But for every child of God throughout all the ages, here's... here's here it is. This is this is the biblical formula. You walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the works of the flesh. That's what that's what he says. But this comes back to the same thing I was telling you before. By the spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. Walking in the spirit is that same truth. By the spirit, I put to death Here's what you and I have to figure out. The Spirit of God, you will all testify, is real. The Spirit of God is with us. But how do I tap the supply of power that the Spirit has there? And you know what? Clearly, if He's he's exhorting us to walk in the Spirit... There's ways to not walk in the Spirit. Certainly, there are Christians who fall into the works of the flesh. And they're not living according to the fruits of the Spirit. Certainly, there there is the danger of grieving the Spirit by which we get that power. How This is the question of the Christian life. How do I... Because, because something... There's a responsibility aspect on our part. It's true that we need to have the right mindset. And that needs to undergird this whole thing. I mean, you see that reality like there in what Romans, Romans 6, verse 11 and 12. First, I have to count myself dead to sin. And then I resist sin reigning in my mortal body. I mean, I have to think right before I act right. So clearly how we think is important in knowing who we are and what's at our disposal. But does, does just knowing who I am automatically bring me to walking in the Spirit? Not necessarily. I mean, I may know who I am in Christ, but if I've, if I, if I've grieved the very Spirit from which I get that power, the channel is clogged. How? I mean, it's, it's, it's the question of the Christian life. Sanctification, how we walk a pure life, how we walk godly, how we walk in Christ likeness. We have to walk in the power of the Spirit. We have to walk according to the Spirit. We have to, by the Spirit, put to death these things. I guarantee you this the Spirit of God has power to kill every single sexual, illicit sexual desire you have. Undoubtedly. By the power of the Spirit, you will overcome when that, when that power is unleashed. The, the question of the ages is how do you get it? How do you tap it? I mean, you know, if, if I have to move a heavy desk and I'm asking one of you guys to help, hey, come help me move this desk. I know where you are. I can ask you. Hey, come over. Lend me a hand here. You apply yourself and this thing moves pretty easy. Maybe something I couldn't have moved on my own. You help me move it. I mean, the reality here is I don't have any power on my own. I am only resting on the Spirit for any ability to have success in conquering here. But how do I tap it? You see, that's that's the great question. We all understand it takes desire-killing power and desire-giving power. I need the wrong desires killed and I need the right desires made alive. If I would only come to love what I need to love and hate what I need to hate, it'd be easy, right? I mean, you know, if, if some attractive person of the opposite sex walks by and I just, you know what? I did, it's, it's like sparks on wet kindling. It's not going anywhere. 
Why? Because my desires for my wife, my love for my wife, but more than that, my love for Christ is that much stronger that, well, yeah, I'm not blind. I can see she's attractive. It's not like you look at that and say, like Charles Leiter said before, you don't look at it and say, yuck. But I'm not going there because there's too many other there's too many other desires in my life in another direction than to go in that direction. Does it have any pull? Well, yeah. And obviously, if I entertained it, the pull could become stronger. But right at that moment, I'm not looking that way. Like Job, my eyes aren't going over there because there are enough desires leading me this way. But how do I tap the Spirit's power so that the desires are there? So that I don't fall back to sexual immoral practices or, or homosexual desires? How do I not fall? How do I get it? How do I get it so that when the temptations come, they just don't have the pull like they used to when I'd fall into it all the time? How? I mean, that's the question of the ages. Tapping the power of the Spirit. Listen, the Spirit is a person. He's real. He abides with and is in the Christian All of His power is there. It's just, how do I get Him to give it to me? I mean, you all understand, the Spirit of God has sufficient power to make us perfect on the spot. But there's a way that God is pleased to be glorified to have us tap that power. And of course, if you, if, if you can just think right off, I mean, the Spirit of God came into this world to glorify Christ. And that might, be, that might be really helpful to how we tap this. Look, the truth is, I think it's, the, what, about Galatians 3, verse 5? It says plainly where the supply of the Spirit comes. And what is that terminology? The supply of the Spirit. What does that mean? The supply of the Spirit. Well, the supply of the power of the Spirit. And it comes how? What's that? By the hearing of faith. That's exactly what it says. Now you now think about this. The Spirit of God came to glorify Christ. The way we get the supply of the Spirit is by faith in Christ. Now, look, not just do you get the Spirit in the first place. That was said earlier. I mean, you can read Galatians 3, 1 through 5. It's not just how you receive the Spirit, but how you get the supply of the Spirit is exactly the same way. You see, this is why Scripture, this is why Paul is so careful to point out Living the Christian life is done the same way you first come to Christ the first time. It's by faith. And you say, but look, don't get lost in that word, faith. What is faith? Faith is it's seeing Christ and trusting what He is and who He is. I mean, look, you, Tafik was talking about this Word. The reason you dive in this Word is because it's the Word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing through this Word of Christ. In this, you find the commands of Christ. You find the person of Christ. You find the death of Christ. You find Christ exalted. You find in the Old Testament all these pictures of Christ. You find, that, you find all manner of commandments that we never kept, but Christ kept. Under the, under the law. He came under the law. He kept it all perfectly. You come into the New Testament. You have four Gospels. It's just the life of Christ. You have these epistles that is explaining all this doctrinal reality about what Christ did. It's all about Christ. All focus on Him. And what happens is that as we become involved with Christ and intimate with Christ, and walking with Christ, and praying to Christ, and in His Word, and seeing Him in there. Isn't this, isn't this exactly what we find? 
from one degree of glory to another, we're transformed into that same image as we behold the Lord, and it's done by the Spirit who is the Lord. And what does it have to do with? Beholding the glory of the Lord by degrees. And you know what? It may be that you have devotions and you dive in that word and you come away and you say, well, I don't feel any different. No, you don't feel any different because it happens by degrees. But I guarantee this, the man or the woman who is constantly going back there, constantly, day after day after day, I was just telling my family recently in devotions, it's just like my son Joshua. You know, if I just stare at him, I can't see him growing. But it's really evident to me he's growing. Why? Because it's happening by degrees. I can't visibly see it, but it's happening, and it's happening constant, and he's getting, he's growing. I, I mean, he's, he's, he's like added a foot in very little time. I can't visibly detect it, but it's happening so that, you know, if you haven't seen him, Charity goes away to India, and she comes back, she can see, whoa, he grew. Well, that's just how it is with a Christian. You know, you'll, you'll look away a little bit and you come back in three months or six months and it's like, wow, they're growing. Well, I, I guarantee, how's that happening? Well, it, with all that growth is godliness. It's Christ-likeness. It's because all these degrees of glory add up to where there's significant growth. And suddenly they're overcoming. They're overcoming sin. They're living godly. They're living like Christ. The way he lived, the way he walked, they're, they're living and walking. It's, it's far more evident now. They're getting mastery over sexual temptation. Why? And I'll guarantee this, it didn't happen by just osmosis. It didn't just happen because they grit their teeth and, or by a list of rules. See, that's one of the mistakes too. Yes, there's a place for fences. But you get to the place where you think the fences are going to do it, you're in trouble. You set up fences without spending quality time with Christ, it's not going to work. You'll, you'll trample those fences down because your desires will take you over the top of them. You, you've got to go. Look, this is, this is how it is. The Spirit and by Him, you put to death these deeds of the body. You have to walk in the Spirit, in His power. His power, He, His supply, it is supplied by faith in Christ, trusting Him, looking to Him, beholding Him. And what happens is the Spirit just gets excited when Christ gets glorified and honored and worshipped and trusted. And the Spirit says, I like that. I'm pouring out my power here. And that's how it happens. It's going to happen in connection with Christ all the time. And if you try any other way, that's what faith is. You don't want to miss that. Faith is not this ambiguous thing that you can't put any definition to. It constantly has to be in our minds this idea of looking away from my own efforts and my own help and my own self and seeing and beholding a beauty in Christ and beholding a help in Christ and beholding the cross of Christ beholding that in that cross was unleashed power to save me from the power of my sin. Not just the guilt of it, but the power. It's in the cross. And it's not just that it happened and it automatically comes to me. It comes to me as I behold it. As I gaze. That's, that's what faith is all about. Faith is looking somewhere. Not at yourself. It's looking at Christ. And if you try any other way to fight this battle, you'll miserably fail. And it happens by degrees. If you want... If you think you're going to have 100% success, look, I can tell you this. I know of nobody who started the Christian life and did not fail, fall, or falter with regards to sexual sin. If you have this idea that, you know, there are some folks that don't talk about it as much. And, and you know what? There, are, there likely are examples. I just don't know of any personally. Of anybody that's been honest enough to talk about it, I know of nobody personally. I mean, you're going to say, what? The Apostle Paul? You're going to say he fell? No, I, I, look, I don't know about the Apostle Paul because he doesn't say. He doesn't say what his struggles were. And he, he had grace at, at a level that few others have. 
But I know this, even among pastors, the typical testimony is that there's a struggle. There's a battle. And it's not 100% victory. There's falls, sometimes repeated. There's tears. There's bitter weeping like Peter. There's a battle. But in spending quality and deep time in the Word and in prayer, communing with Christ, coming to know Him, going to His Word not just as ritualistic to work through your daily reading, but to stop and see Christ, to watch Him as He walked and talked, admire Him, to hear His words and see how He talked and listen to His promises. You do that day in, day out. And then you know what? Suddenly you come to realize the power of sexual sin is fading as the glory of Christ is increasing in my sight. And as my, my person is being shaped and conformed and molded to Him by the Spirit, resurrection power is being channeled a little more by degrees, a little more, a little more, a little more. But it is an irresistible power. It is the raw power of God. And sin cannot hold up against it. Temptation cannot hold up. It's not just God giving me a way out. It's the power of God killing old desires of the body and putting new desires. And they're real. And they're, they're powerful. They're felt. The tug is diminished. And there's a draw, a pull in another direction. But it, there's no substitute. You cannot walk in the Spirit unless you're finding Christ. Unless you're finding His glory. There will be no power any other way. And that's, that's where the Galatians went wrong. They were seeking to be perfected by the law. You seek to be perfected anywhere, any way, anyhow, other than Christ. Failure. Mark it down. You can grit your teeth and go to sexual immoralist anonymous or whatever. I don't think there is such a thing. But look, you can try all the human ways. You can try all the human means. And they're not going to work. They won't do it. You'll not tame that dragon. There's only one way. The power of God slain it. By the Spirit, You've got to put these deeds of the body to death. Which means you're reliant, not on your own strength or on the world. You're reliant on the power of God by way of the Spirit. But the Spirit, being one person of the Godhead, will not channel that power to you unless you are worshiping, admiring, and glorifying the second person. That's the way God the Father set it up. Yeah. The first person. He set it up for the second person to be glorified. You don't want to glorify the Spirit in it. We recognize that the power comes from Him, but even the Spirit of God Himself defers to Christ. He came to glorify Him. Yeah. Not Himself. Christ. That's why these churches, charismatic churches, that make a huge deal out of the Spirit are so carnal. And given over to sexual sin and greed and covetousness. All these health, wealth, prosperity guys. Given over to every lust. They exalt the Spirit. Not Christ. Where Christ is most exalted, people will be most pure. There's no substitute for this. This, I mean, you can, you can make... You can, Draw the links all the way through the chain. You need power. The Spirit has the power. The Spirit is supplied by faith. Not faith in faith or faith in the Spirit. By faith in Christ. Which is looking to Christ. 
and trusting Christ and seeing Christ. That's, that's the chain. There's no substitute at all. You want to change your desires? You want to stop lusting? You want to stop being pulled into the internet? You want to stop doing what you do that is like the Gentiles, what they do who know not God? You want to stop doing shameful things in secret places in the darkness? There's no substitute but abiding in the glory of Christ, drawing near to Him, beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ. There's no substitute. That's how the Word of God comes in because you don't see Christ anywhere except in that book. Yes, you can know some things about God through the creation. But as far as His Son, as far as the salvation, as far as the cross, as far as His beauty, it's in this book. That's the chain. And even if you don't get the chain, you just know this. People that spend lots of time communing with Christ in prayer and in this Word, they're the ones that tend to be godly. Well, that's, this is the reason why. And people that try any other way, you try like the Galatians, going to the law. I'll tell you, you can gaze on the seventh commandment out of the ten commandments from now till doomsday and you're not going to get any help. That's where the law fails you. Is it good? Yeah. It's a good standard. But you know what? God did what the law couldn't do. Because it was weakened by our flesh. The law never gave help. But Jesus Christ, He took upon Himself the likeness of sinful flesh. He gave Himself for sin. And He conquered the power. So that those of us who walk according to the Spirit, we're freed. We're helped. We've broken the bond. The law of the Spirit of life trumps over this law of sin and death. We're released from the grip of a power that we could not in our own strength release ourselves from. But the Spirit does. And Christ bought this for us. But don't miss this. If you, if you go to the law, you'll find no help there. In fact, all the law tends to do is stir up more sinful passion. That's what it did with the Galatians. It was just stirring up carnal mindsets and carnal activity towards one another. That's what the law will do. You need Christ. It's not a magic fix. and It's not going to happen in a day. But by degrees. And so you give yourself to it day in and day out, calling on the Lord, asking for help, going to Him, walking with Him, communing with Him. And there's no substitute for time with Him. If you're into the five-minute Christian deal a day, the five-minute devotion, one-minute reading, you know, whatever kind of garbage books that are out there, that's not it. And you know what? Even some of you guys, you move into the grace house. You want accountability. Accountability is not going to do it. That's like, one, that's like these fences I'm talking about. If, if you try to substitute Christ with accountability, failure. It's fail right there. Now, accountability can be good, but no substitute for Christ. All your fences, all your accountability, all your gizmos and gadgets you put on your internet to try to keep you it's that's useless that's just that's foolish i mean i'm not saying there may not be a place for it and that it could be helpful but look if you're not communing with christ do you think putting some kind of barrier on your internet is going to do it it's not going to do it 
That isn't, that isn't going to do anything. You'll bypass that in a second. You just take it off your computer. You'll go to somebody else's computer. You'll just feed off the pictures in your imagination that are already there. It's, not, it's no protection. You need the power of the Spirit supplied by faith in Christ. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Seeing Christ in that Word. Don't... Whatever your Bible reading schedule... Look, I do not recommend a Bible reading schedule that starts in Genesis and then for, you know, two-thirds of the year before you get to Matthew. And then you do four Gospels straight in a row and then you get on into the Epistles. Intermix your Bible reading with the four Gospels all year long. I remember John MacArthur saying he preached a message in the morning, message in the evening throughout his whole ministry. And he said he always aimed at preaching one of the Gospels morning or evening. Or something, typically it was one of the Gospels because he wanted Christ before his people all the time. That's healthy. That's good. That's wise. Because he's exactly right. That's, that's where the power comes from. That's where a transformed church comes from. Okay. Amen. All righty, brethren. May God help you fight this battle, which you know you can see the battle is fought on the level of being with Christ. If you're going to discipline yourself to godliness, the discipline is you've got to schedule your lives. And your time, even with Christians, it's no good. Fellowship is no good if it's robbing you of time with Christ. You've got to schedule your lives and discipline your lives to get alone with Christ. If any of you men are living at the Grace House and you cannot get alone with Christ there, move out. If you cannot figure out a place in that house to go, or a place you can walk to, or a library you can go hide out in, or somebody's vehicle that you can go get inside, and you are not getting quality time alone with Christ because of the living situation, wherever it is, Grace House or anywhere else, get out. Don't stay there. Don't kill yourself spiritually if you're in any kind of situation where you cannot get with Christ. You've, there's no substitute. Go walk over in the cemeteries. But you've got to have that or you cannot win this fight. You will not win this fight. You'll be lukewarm. You'll be battling carnality all the time. You'll be grieving the Spirit. There's no substitute for the Christian life for, than Christ Himself. And feeding on Him. He said you need to eat His flesh. Drink His blood. It means you've got to take the truths of Him in and digest them and chew them. You will not be a giant in the Christian faith if you don't get this straight. And remember what Hudson Taylor said. You know, there are no giants. Or the giants in the faith, they're the ones that have faith in a great God. But the truth is that there are... Look, all you have to do is look around. In our church, there are people that excel others. There are people that bypass others. Throughout history, there have been those who have lived godlier lives. And it comes back to this. Look at their devotional life. Look at their walk. Look at their discipline in getting alone with Christ. There's no substitute.